Hey everyone, Patrick Kennedy here with Microchip. In this video, we are going to check out how to implement the I2C communication protocol on PIC and AVR microcontrollers. First, we're going to cover what I2C is, how it works, and where it's used. Then we're going to do a quick walkthrough of how to implement the I2C protocol in just a couple lines of code using Microchip Foundation Services. Microchip Foundation Services is a relatively new software library within the MPLabX code configurator that aims to get users up and running quickly with an emphasis on portability. The generated code is made portable by retaining all function notation at the application layer, meaning your application code will be device agnostic. So if you start off developing with one device and decide to switch to a new device, this allows you to quickly generate new device drivers in MCC without needing to modify your application code. This gives us easy access to the hardware peripherals of any device supported in MCC. I'll be demonstrating this later on when I switch my I2C master device from a PIC device to an AVR without having to modify any code. If you're already familiar with I2C, feel free to skip ahead using the on-screen links. If not, let's get started. Okay, so I2C is a multi-master, multi-slave, half-duplex synchronous communication protocol over a two-wire interface. This basically just means that information is only going to be permitted to travel in one direction on the bus at any given time, and that one clock source will be shared between the two devices and will determine how quickly we can send communication back and forth. You can see how the physical layer of the bus is set up with two wires here labeled SDA for serial data and SCL for serial clock. The protocol is generally used for short or medium transmission distances and permits a lower board space due to the reduction in wires needed. Master devices control who is sending what data where, while slaves simply wait to be called on for information. The protocol allows for 7 or 10 bit addressing, which means we could theoretically have up to 128 or over 1000 devices on the bus although you'll likely run into other issues before you hit those theoretical thresholds. Fundamentally, I2C is simply a standard for how we are going to manipulate the signal on the data line around the pulsating clock signal driving the clock line. The clock line is acting as a metronome or beat to keep devices on the bus on the same page. The basic structure of the data line consists of a start bit, a control byte, a data byte, followed by a stop bit. Each transmission across the bus is always followed by an acknowledgement or ACK or non-acknowledgement or NAC. Let's see it in action for a master device reading two bytes from a slave device. Right, so the bus starts in idle mode as the SDA and SCL lines are both pulled high. A master device grabs the bus by pulling the SDA line low while the SCL line is still high. You can imagine how having tens to hundreds of masters vying for the same bus can introduce some difficulties. The master then sends a 7-bit slave address defined in the slave device data feed by pulling the SDA line high or low on each clock pulse. For a bit to be valid, the SDA line must remain constant between the rising and falling edge of a clock pulse. The master follows up the 7-bit slave address with a single bit indicating whether data will be read or written to complete the control byte. The slave then acknowledges the transmission by pulling the SDA line low before the falling edge of the ninth clock pulse. Having acknowledged the transmission, the slave sends the requested data byte back across the data line. The master then acknowledges the transmission and the slave starts transmitting the next byte. Finally, a stop bit, P, is signaled when the clock line rises first, directly followed by the data line. I went ahead and made a flowchart that should hopefully simplify the process. Looking more closely, we can see the bus can basically be modeled as a finite state machine. Now that we have a firm understanding of the protocol, let's try to implement it. Okay, so for this example, I'm going to simply read temperature data being logged by an MCP9600 to the PIC18 F47Q10 microcontroller over I2C and then display the data to my screen over USART. I'll be using the Curiosity Nano platform with the PIC18 F47Q10, the Thermo J clickboard from Micro Electronica, a basic J type temperature probe, and the Curiosity Nano baseboard for clicks. See the links in the description for more info if you want the hardware yourself. I2C is a relatively strict standard, so this example should be applicable to any PIC or AVR device with a peripheral that supports I2C as you'll see later. This includes peripherals like the master synchronous serial port and the two-wire interface that are common on PIC and AVR devices. Okay, go ahead and open a new project in MPLabX with your respective device and open up MCC. We'll start off by modifying the system module to use an internal oscillator since the Q10 microcontroller is going to act as the master device and therefore will drive the clock. Next, move over to the left pane under Device Resources and open Libraries, Foundation Services, and double-click I2C Simple to add the library to your project. 
Under Project Resources, I squared C Simple and I squared C Master should show up under Libraries. These are the I squared C drivers that are going to be automatically generated. You'll also notice in the same pane under the Peripherals directory that MSSP1 is now shown. MSSP stands for Master Synchronous Serial Port and is a core independent peripheral available on most PIC devices and handles most of the I squared C protocol and hardware with minimal software interference. It actually also handles SPI, but we're not going to get into that today. Alright, so next add the USART peripheral to the project under Device Resources Peripherals. Then navigate over to the USART module, check Enable Transmit, as well as redirect STDIO to USART, and also make sure the baud rate is set to 9600. Next, navigate down to the pin manager. We need to configure the connections of our pins, so we'll need to check out the data sheet. You can access this under the kit page tab or just through a quick Google search. Looking at the schematic on page 20 of the PIC18 F47Q10 Curiosity Nano Datasheet, we can see that the RB2 pin corresponds to the SDA data line, while the RB1 pin corresponds to the SCL clock line. We'll need to go ahead and connect these pins. It's important to note that the peripheral pin select feature available on most PIC devices allows you to easily map these signals to a variety of other pins. On the same page, we can also see that the USART is tied to the CDC bridge on pins RD0 and RD1, so we'll need to connect those pins as well so we can print the data to the terminal. Before we move on, let's take a quick look at the Foundation Services documentation so we have an idea of the functionality of the code we're about to generate. To do so, just click on the question mark next to the I squared C simple module on the left pane. Glancing through, we can see that this library provides high level functions for reading and writing one or more bytes from a device given an input of a slave address as well as a register address that will define what specific data we want from the device. Okay, so let's minimize this window for later reference and go ahead and generate the configuration files. We are then going to navigate to the main.c file where our application code will reside. Okay, so let's open the MCP9600 datasheet to find the slave address and the register address so we can go ahead and call the function we just generated. We can find the 7-bit slave address on page 6 of the datasheet. Let's copy and paste that into our main.c file. To learn more about the registers, we'll need to check out the functional description of the device. The device includes a few registers I can read from. The one I'm most interested in is the thermocouple temperature register, or TH register, that contains the error corrected thermocouple temperature. The register descriptions indicates that the data is stored in two bytes, and that to convert the temperature I'll need to shift some bits to convert the two bytes to a more readable format. Let's copy the register pointer and put that in our main.c file as well. Okay, so in our main.c file, let's define the slave address and slave register pointer as macros since we won't be changing these in our code. In our main loop, we'll need to define a variable to hold the most recent value read from the MCP9600 chip. I'm going to call mine sensorval. Hopping back over to the library documentation, we can see that there is a function for reading two bytes provided by the Foundation Services API. All we need to do is call the readToBytes function with our slave and register values we defined and store the output in our sensorval variable. We will then simply print to the terminal using a printf statement, making sure to shift some bits in order to get the temperature in degree C. Hit compile and run to program the device, open up your terminal, connect to the right port with the specified baud rate, and you're done. Okay, so in this example we use the Foundation Services API within the Microchip Code Configurator or MCC to set up an i squared seed master using the PIC18 F47Q10 microcontroller, and most importantly, we used its underlying peripherals with relative ease. 
Now let's say for some reason I realize later on that I need to switch the device, perhaps because I found another device that has a unique feature or peripheral I want to make use of. Let's say for example I want to switch over to the AT Mega 4809 to make use of the event system peripheral. Now, I could head over to Atmel Start or Studio and rebuild my entire project from scratch, which would require me to learn a new tool in the process. Or, I could simply open a new project in MPLabX with my device, open up MCC, grab the I2C Simple Master Foundation Services library just like before, set up the USART to print to my terminal over the CDC bridge, make sure my pins are routed correctly as shown on the datasheet, generate my code, and simply copy and paste the main.c file over. I can then just hit build and program and the device will print the exact same thing to the screen as before. And just like that, I was able to port my application to a new device in about 30 seconds. Now if you found this as helpful as I did when messing around with foundation services, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, share, or just sigh in satisfaction. You can find the links for all relevant hardware and software materials in the description below. Thanks for watching.